Okay, so this uh, example we have a reaction as well. We have zinc reacting with silver. Silver ions have the potential to add an extra electron and become neutral. Zinc has two valence electrons. They are in the 4s subshell. So when I put those together, I have a competition. Either the zinc could hold its electrons that it's starting with, or the silver could grab them from the zinc. So I would have to look on the activity series we talked about to determine which of those is better at attracting electrons. If I did, I would find out the silver is. So once the silver picks up an electron, it should become neutral. And once the zinc loses two electrons, since it has two that it's capable of losing, it should become a zinc two plus. And then to balance that, I need to balance the number of positives on both sides. And I also need to balance the amount of silver on both sides. So that's a balanced reaction that it gives us. Then it says, I'm starting with excess zinc metal. What that means is the zinc is not going to be limited. The amount of product I can make is going to depend on the amount of silver ions that I put in and that information is that I have 50 milliliters 50.0 of a solution 0 0.100 molar of silver nitrate so that's all given I'm going to put that in a calorimeter and the temperature is going to go up from 19.25 to 22.18. So what's happening here in my calorimeter, whatever this insulated container, no heat's going to escape. So I put my zinc in there, I have excess zinc, I add my silver ions, they collide, exchange electrons, and the temperature goes from the initial temperature of 19.25 to the final temperature of 22.17. So then it says the heat capacity of the calorimeter is 98.6 joules per Celsius. So that's the heat capacity. What is that telling me? What's heat capacity? Well, it's one unit per another unit, right? It's joules per degree Celsius. So that's a relationship that is specific to that calorimeter, to that insulated container that this reaction is taking place in, that tells me how much energy the calorimeter can absorb before the temperature of the calorimeter goes up. It's a relationship between energy and temperature. So when I'm measuring a temperature increase, I need this relationship, the heat capacity, to tell me how much energy the calorimeter absorbed to cause that temperature increase. So that's a relationship I'll definitely need to use there. And then it says, calculate the enthalpy change for the reaction. So this is my reaction. I want to know delta H for the reaction and that's usually in kilojoules per mole of reaction. Then it gives me a little bit more information. It says assume the density and specific heat of the solution are the same as those for water and ignore the specific heats of the metal. Right, so this solution of silver chloride, the solvent here is in water. So mostly what I have here is the water and water has a specific heat it tells me the solution should have the same specific heat as water which is 4.184 that would be given to you joules per gram of water per degree Celsius that's another relationship so what's happening here is I observe this reaction take place and that causes the temperature to go up is the reaction endothermic or exothermic It's 
exothermic. The surroundings, the surroundings temperature is going up, right? It's the surroundings that's the water and the calorimeter. That's what I'm observing the temperature change for. If the surroundings temperature going up, the surroundings is increasing its kinetic energy. Where does it get that kinetic energy from? That's the energy that the reaction released. So the reaction must be releasing energy from the reaction's point of view. The energy is going out. That's exo, exothermic process. So I already know, just based on that, that when I calculate delta H, it's going to be a negative value because from the point of view of the system, which is where we always consider it, if the system is giving away energy to the surroundings, that's exothermic, that's a negative. So I know that. And what I'm saying here, what the information is telling me is that when this reaction takes place and releases energy, some of the energy is going into the water because the water absorbs a certain amount of energy to cause the temperature increase through the water, depending on how much water there is. And some of the energy that reaction releases is going into the calorimeter because the calorimeter absorbs a certain amount of energy to cause the temperature change. So I have a temperature increase for both the water and the calorimeter. And so what I need to de determine then is what's the total amount of energy absorbed by both the water and the calorimeter based on that temperature change. How much ever energy the water and the calorimeter are absorbing should be equal to the amount of energy the reaction is giving off. So I can say the amount of heat energy given off by the reaction, which will be equal to delta H for the reaction, and that will be negative, will be equal to the opposite of the quantity of heat absorbed by the water plus the quantity of heat absorbed by the calorimeter. Law of conservation of energy says that the amount of energy exchange between the reaction and the combined surroundings should be equal. So I need both of those. I need the amount of energy uh, absorbed by the water and the amount of energy absorbed by the calorimeter. So to determine the amount of energy absorbed by the water, that's going to be <coughs> dependent upon how much the water temperature goes up. So it's telling me the temperature is going up from 22 or from 19.25 to 22.17. So if I subtract those, that's an increase of 2.92 degrees Celsius. So if the water's temperature goes up by 2.92 degrees Celsius and the water's Heat capacity, uh, specific heat is 4.184 joules per degree Celsius per gram of water. I can multiply those together and I will see, since I'm working with the units and including them in my calculation, that the degree Celsius cancel. I want to know Q, which is heat, which is measured in joules or kilojoules. So I want everything to cancel except the joule or kilojoule energy units. So I also need to cancel the grams of water, how many grams of water do I have? Well, it's given that I have 50 millers of solution and it's telling me that the density of the solution is the same as the density of water. So that would have to be given. So on the exam, I would have to give you that the density of the solution is 1.00 grams per milliliter. I have to tell you that information. Or I would have to tell you how many grams uh, of the solution there are. So if I've got 50 milliliters of water and its density is one gram of water per one milliliter of water, then I've got 50 grams. So I would include that here and now that cancels. So that's the total amount of heat absorbed by the water. I want to add to that the amount of heat absorbed by the calorimeter to determine the total amount of heat given off by the reaction. So the calorimeter 
its temperature is also going up by 2.92 degrees Celsius. The calorimeter and the water are in the same surroundings, they're in the same environment, they're touching one another, so one of them's temperature goes up, it would be transferring kinetic energy with the other, so they, all, they both should have the same temperature increase. So that's also 2.92 degrees Celsius. But the calorimeter, when it has a temperature change, a different quantity of energy will cause the calorimeter's temperature change than the quantity of energy causing the water's temperature change because they don't have the same way of taking in energy and expressing that as a, as a temperature increase. So for the calorimeter, it's 98.6 joules per degree Celsius. And so there, I have no gram units, the degree Celsius cancel, I've got joules. So I can finish that bracket. That should be the total amount of energy absorbed by the surroundings based on the way the question is asked. So I want to simplify this by multiplying some things together. So 2.92 times 4.184 times 50 gives me 6.5 0.9 joules plus the calorimeter was 2.92 times 98.6 that's 287.9 joules so if I then add those together I get 898.8 .8 joules. So that is, a t if the question asks the total quantity of energy exchanged between the system and the surroundings, that's the quantity. From the system's point of view, it's negative because the system is losing that energy, transferring into the surroundings. From the surroundings point of view, it would be a positive value. Questions about that so far? Okay, so the question though in the textbook is asking what is delta H for the reaction? That should be in kilojoules or joules per mole of reaction. So that, that's the total quantity of energy produced or exchanged with the surroundings. That's the amount of energy that the reaction gave off, but I need to put that in an amount of energy per mole of reaction. So I need to know how many moles of reaction there were. So I need a a little bit more to calculate here. I need to say how many kilojoules of energy were there per mole of reaction. And right now I have an amount in joules. So one thing I can do is to convert the joules to kilojoules. But I still need to figure out how many moles of the reaction there were and divide by that. Well, it's convenient that they're telling me the zinc is in excess because the number of moles of reaction that take place will not depend on the amount of zinc. I've got extra of that. It's going to depend on the limiting amount of silver ions. So I, w I need to know how many moles of silver ions are here. If I have 50 milliliters of this solution, and the molarity of that solution is 0 0.100 moles of silver nitrate per liter of solution. So to work that out, I need the liters and milliliters to cancel. And I need to recognize that when the silver nitrate goes into solution, it's going to break apart and the silver, the silver ions and nitrate ions will separate. And that's a one to one ratio. So I can say for every one AG NO3, I have I have one AG plus. That should be moles. 
so I can cancel milliliters I can cancel liters of solution and I cancel moles of the compound and I've got moles of silver that's what I wanted so that number will go here so that's 50 times 0.1 divided by a thousand that gives me 0 0.00500 moles and then I know that in this reaction there are two moles of silver in every mole of reaction so I need that conversion two moles of silver for every one mole of reaction so this is my ultimate calculation there so the answer there comes from canceling joules and moles of silver ions to get kilojoules per mole of reaction, which are the units I wanted. So then I know I'm finally done, and I would ne have negative 898.8 divided by 10 to the third divided by 0 0.005 times 2, and I get negative 3. 6 P kilojoules per mole and I'm limited to 3 sig figs by the 3 sig figs in the point zero zero five zero zero. so this is my answer here in the end questions about that? So these are hard. You have to have some understanding of what's happening conceptually and a lot of experience doing conversions. And you have to really focus on the units and keep track of not just when you have kilojoules of something, but what is that thing you have kilojoules of because a unit will only cancel with another unit if they're for the same substance. But if you don't understand conceptually what's happening with the energy and how it's being transferred from the system to the surroundings in this case, you know, then it's hard to even s set that up. So you have to start with a conceptual understanding of what's happening with the energy to set the problem up and understand what all the relationships are.